Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin, and this is the start of week four. So I've taken you through error, we've done atomic spectroscopy, and now we're entering chromatography. This is one of my favorite parts of the class to teach, partly because chromatography is sort of conceptually interesting to me, and perhaps more importantly, are the wide range of applications that you can apply it to. So it's just really fun to learn about. What we're going to be doing is really breaking down our treatment of chromatography in the next three weeks into three pieces. One is basic theory, which is what we'll do this week, and then we're going to be going through gas and liquid chromatography in two separate weeks to kind of emphasize some of the ideas and give you a lot of the examples and information about the instrumentation. So in week four then, it's going to be kind of about the theory of chromatography, making really sure you understand how the system works and then the conceptual foundation. Goals for this week is to make sure that you know what defines a chromatogram, when a, a peak is going to come out of a chromatography system, and also something about the width of that peak. Okay, so in this mini lecture then, we're going to be just going over some of the highlights of chromatography. And I really want you to walk away with kind of three things. First off, chromatography is really applied to organic molecules. While there are certainly cases, specialized cases, where you can use it for metals analysis, this isn't about atoms. This is about molecular structure and the separation of molecular structure. That's the second point. Things have to separate in chromatography. It's a little bit more like mass spectrometry where you're separating ions, for example, in that system. In chromatography, separation is absolutely essential and it's one of the reasons it's such a powerful tool. And then finally, I want to just introduce you to what a chromatogram is. A chromatogram is the data that comes out of a chromatography experiment. So the applications for chromatography are widespread. One of them that is really fascinating is the observation that if you look at dollar bills in this country, or actually hundred dollar bills to be exact, over 80% of them contain appreciable amounts of cocaine. And in fact, there's a very interesting story about why that is if you want to go look that up on Google. Of course, our case study for chromatography, which you'll be getting next week, is going to be about chocolate and the analysis of chocolate using both gas and liquid chromatography. So you can understand the flavor elements. Why is it something tastes for example, like a nut to you. Well, it's not a single chemical, usually there's a lot. And chocolate is famous for the very, very many different kinds of chemicals that give rise to that wonderful flavor. And I think a third example that I can draw from some of the recent um, news stories on contaminated drugs is the role of chromatography in the pharmaceutical industry. It's absolutely vital. And so really it's important both because you can use it to characterize the drugs that you're making, but more importantly, you can use it to characterize the purity. So if you have these processes for making drugs that people are taking, for example, statins or other kind of things, and you're not able to really assess batch to batch, if you might have impurities present, then that can really present a danger. A couple of fun facts. 5% um, of research in chemistry is done using some kind of chromatography, and estimates are that 50% of chemistry and industry involves the use of chromatography as an analytical tool. This is kind of an interesting definition of chromatography I got from the Oxford English Dictionary. You might want to pause and take a look at it. Why it's so interesting is that something's wrong with this definition. So I want you to read it over, and you haven't learned chromatography yet, but you'll see in a couple of slides what's wrong with it. There's something really important about chromatography that's missing from this definition. So chromatography really started in the 1900s, where a botanist who was studying leaf pigments decided to try to figure out what was inside of them. So what you would hear, see here is a type of chromatography called paper chromatography, or thin layer chromatography. It's not used very much now, at least not in a research sense, but you'll use it a lot in organic chemistry laboratories as undergraduates. Um, and what you do is you basically spot your sample on a piece of paper, and you can see over here in this image the circle with the yellow, that was where the sample was spotted. And you'll notice that a bunch of bands have separated because the solvent from that spot onto the paper was basically being pulled into the paper just to wet the paper. And that's the mobile phase, the solvent. And the leaf pigments, which are different molecules, are being dragged along with the solvent, but they moved at different speeds. The speedy Gonzales leaf pigment is that kind of bluish one probably some kind of chlorophyll, whereas the slower ones are the yellow ones, and so they didn't move as fast. But what you do know is the solvent in this case moved much faster than everything. Anyhow, this botanist Twet was able to actually figure out all the different chemicals of leaf pigments, and he used this paper chromatography as a way of separating them. Now what we do these days is not paper chromatography. We actually run materials through a column, usually a vertical column, sometimes it's horizontal, but we apply pressure, and the column 
is, the, is like the paper, gives you more volume for the separation and a lot more control over the measurement. Now, in an actual chromatography system, what we're going to do then is add one important thing to the example from history. So as you see here, this is a great um, description of chromatography, and we'll be going through this more over the next three weeks. But the basic idea is you're going to have a column, and you're going to wet the column first with your solvent. So usually you let a chromatography system equilibrate. It's some sort of solid or stationary phase. Good way to think of it for now is like a sponge. So you're wetting the sponge, getting it all ready. And then you put in your sample, which here is the purple stuff. And then at a certain time, the solvent is now pulling the purple stuff through. It could just be gravity column, or you could be applying a pressure to it. And purple is, of course, blue and red. So the red component moves faster than the blue component. And as it goes through the sample, that gets the column, excuse me, that gets further and further apart. So the blue and the red separate in time. One of them is really slow, it's the turtle. The other is the hair, it's really fast. And so if you are looking at the end of the chromatography system, if you're detecting what comes out of the column, you're going to see the red and the blue at different times. And that's really the important feature about chromatography. It is both a separation and a detection instrument. And therein is the reason the Oxford English Dictionary definition was wrong, at least in my book, from a functional perspective. So what do the magic boxes look like in chromatography? We're going to be really dealing with instrumentation in the next two weeks after this one, but I want to give you a flavor for what a chromatography box looks like. Well, first off, it's going to be measuring organic materials, organic molecules, usually small organic molecules, maybe a little bit bigger. There's a type of chromatography called size exclusion chromatography that can really measure larger polymers. We won't be talking about that very much, but generally speaking, it's for organics. You got to be able to pump material into your system. So chromatography instruments often have a lot of pumps. You're going to have to handle liquids or gases. You're going to have to modulate the flow. You're going to have to um, have a way to deal with the waste in both cases. Then you're going to have the column itself where all the separation takes place. You know, one's going to move faster than the other. If you have 50 components, you hope they all move at slightly different speeds. And then down at the end of the column, you're going to detect. So the three major sort of functions of the box are going to be, first of all, to handle what we call the mobile phase, which is the phase that's pushing things through the chromatography system. Then you're going to have to have the column itself, which is where all the separation occurs. And then finally, you're going to detect. And the two types of chromatography that we do are really gas and liquid. And what that refers to is the identity of that mobile phase. So that botanist looking at leaf pigments was clearly doing liquid phase chromatography. His mobile phase was liquid. But more common, you'll see gas phase chromatography. So this is a rough sketch of a gas phase chromatography system. You can see there's a, a mobile phase, which is a gas that's continually flowing through the system. The column is a coiled up uh, piece of either packed bed column or an open column column. We'll talk more about that. Uh, that's usually in an oven, because in gas chromatography, you need your analytes to be volatile. That's one of the requirements. And then they come off the column at different times, and you have a detector at the end. Could be an FID. It could be an ECD. Those are all acronyms we'll talk about next week. But to make a long story short, the GC system is actually pretty simple. Uh, what you're looking at in this picture is actually a photograph of inside an oven of a gas chromatography system. You can see it's mainly empty. It's got a fan to stabilize the temperature. And in the upper left corner is where the injection is. Liquid chromatography is actually a more complicated instrument. One of the things it has to do is it has to handle a bunch of solvents, as you see over the left. So now you have solvents getting pushed through the system. Um, and it will often have multiple pumps for that. So the pumping processes and what you need to pump in liquid chromatography is a big deal. Um, and then this column over here to the right is really where all the separation occurs. And so things move differently through the column. And then, of course, you might want to collect what comes off the column. You might be doing it for separation. But that's not really what we'll be talking too much about. But realize, for example, in a lot of pharmaceutical work, you don't just use chromatography to look at what's in a sample. You might use it to purify the sample. But really, you're going to have a detector at the end of a chromatography system. You can imagine it would be your eye as was true in the case of the botanist who used his eye to see the different colors of pigments. Or it could be an ultraviolet visible detector. Um, it could be a mass spec. Uh, you can get a lot of different detectors put on the ends of these things. And that really is an important choice that you'll learn to make when you design an LC system for particular separations. 
It's kind of an interesting system. Here's a picture of somebody using one. It's usually stacked up way high with the solvents up at top. Um, usually cost anywhere from a cheap one might be 100,000 up to a couple of 100,000. What you get out of both of those instruments then is this kind of data. It's a very important graph for you to understand. What you're doing is you're measuring the signal on a detector, and that detector will be dominated. The choice of that detector will be determined by what you're looking at and what your mobile phase is. Of course, if it's gas or liquid. But that signal tells you that something's come off the column. So it's like you're sitting there waiting and saying, where is it, where is it, where is it, and then boom, there it is, and then it goes away. And the time that the peak comes out is very important. That helps you identify it. And how big the peak is helps you know how much is there. So one of the features of chromatography then is it can be used for both quantitative analysis where you might integrate under the peak to figure out how much stuff was there. So you'll often see integrated peak areas for measurements that are quantitative. If you want to know, for example, how much cocaine did the dollar bill have, you'll do a quantitative analysis based on the area under a peak that you have already assigned to be cocaine. On the other hand, you can do qualitative analysis. What if you're interested in what makes chocolate smell good? Well, you will see lots and lots of different chemicals coming off of chocolate. And so you might want to identify what those chemicals are. And so by looking at how many peaks you get and where they come off in time, you will be able to understand something about their chemistry and in some cases actually identify them from that kind of information. So there are a lot of different types of chromatography. I've sort of briefly mentioned two classes, which are gas chromatography, the mobile phase is gas, and liquid chromatography, where the mobile phase is a liquid. But within that, you can have two types of stationary phases. And so when an analyte is moving through a chromatography system, it's being carried by a mobile phase, but it's interacting with something we call the stationary phase. That can be a liquid or a gas for both types of chromatography, but by far the most common is really going to be to have a solid support, although a good way to think of it is it's like a spongy or jello or something kind of open sort of solid, because you actually, as you're going to see, need your analytes to diffuse into it and to interact with it. So I want to conclude this introductory lecture with just showing you a real-world chromatogram. Uh, on the forums, one of our students in this class actually does GCMS for a living, and apparently they look at beer and the volatiles in beer. So I found this particular recipe from Agilent, and one of your missions this week for your quizzes and problem sets will be to go to the websites of chromatography um, companies and pick out some interesting looking analyses and sort of describe them on the quizzes and the problem sets. In any case, uh, you can see there's a lot of stuff in beer, not surprisingly, ethanol, but a whole bunch of other flavor compounds which you can pick up in this kind of analysis. So I hope you've gotten some ideas about what chromatography is about. It's used to measure organic molecules. It both separates things because of how they move through a column or over a stationary phase. And then detectors can tell you when they came out. And some detectors can actually identify what comes off the column when, like a mass spec. So it's, these are a powerful set of tools. And they're incredibly important in a wide variety of industries. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.